Hello, this is Dr. DeVazier, your organic chemistry instructor. The purpose of this video is to introduce you to Lab 2, Infrared Analysis of Starting Materials. Your student goals are the following. Work safely in lab, and we want to make sure that you dispose of any waste properly in the correct containers. If you have any questions, just ask your lab instructor. You also want to uh, learn new techniques, and specifically this lab, you're going to be looking at infrared analysis and the technique of uh, FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. And so ultimately what you want to do in this lab is to uh, obtain quality spectra for your starting materials. Um, this is sort of setting up uh, subsequent labs where you will be taking infrared spectra. Since this is such a, um, an important technique in organic chemistry for structure determination, uh, we decided to devote an entire lab solely to the technique. We want you to think about this experiment. Think about the nature of infrared spectroscopy. Um, you will need to bear with us a little bit. In a uh, lecture, we'll be talking about this in uh, Chem 252. So we won't be discussing this in lecture. Um, this is solely in lab. So think of this as a little bit like learning how to drive a car uh, without necessarily um, thinking about um, uh, how a car would work. So. Um, think about the driving of the automobile or thinking about the experiment of the infrared. Um, what are the issues in terms of sample preparation? How do you achieve a quality spectrum? Um, what are the key components in analysis? That's sort of the things that you want to be thinking about for this lab. Some of these uh, materials are going to be working with are, are solids and others are liquids. Um, be sure that you uh, use proper uh, personal protective equipment. That is, you're using gloves as well as goggles and um, a full dress. And the reason for that is that some of these liquids and solids have higher vapor pressures than um, your standard inorganic materials, and so therefore they um, also may have a high, higher flammability. So um, you want to work in the hood um, and make sure that you avoid any direct exposure to vapors or powders, um, and those are all key aspects to uh, working safely in the lab. The other thing that you might be dealing with is chloroform. Chloroform is a standard solvent in working um, in, in diluting uh, materials or in solubilizing solid materials for uh, the um, acquisition of an infrared spectrum. So you want to make sure that you um, have on gloves when you work with chloroform and that you do not directly inhale any of the vapors. Also, the salt plates you're going to be using uh, are very expensive, so be careful not to uh, damage them in any way. When you um, are disposing of your materials, make sure all flammable liquids go in the flammable waste and all solid materials go in the solid waste container. Um, and so solid uh, chemical compounds will go in the solid waste. You do not put things like um, paper towels or uh, other elements that you use to clean up chemicals um, in the solid waste, uh, only the reagents themselves. What I like to do, particularly in this lab or any lab, um, is to uh, take some of the smaller um, materials that you're going to be working with that you know are going to be disposed of in a particular waste container and collect all of those in a smaller beaker in your hood. And that way, when you're done with the lab, um, you've cleaned up all of your materials inside the hood and they can go directly in your drawer after you've rinsed them uh, well with solvent. And then you take your two beakers to the back of the, uh, uh, of the hood, dispose of your waste materials, rinse out your beakers with a little ethanol rinse and soap and water, and you are clean for the day. It's a, a pretty good setup. I strongly encourage you to use small waste beakers. If you have any questions about how to specifically do this, please ask your instructor. You're going to need to watch several technique tutorials, um, one, actually two of them. One is on the um, infrared analysis. This is a student-driven um, uh, video. It's very short. Um, and then the other one is going to be on FTR, um, FTIR sample preparation. So there's two components. There's the sample preparation, and then there's actually running the experiment, running the instrument, and analyzing the output. Um, you will have some... Um, background materials, uh, ignore please the uh, section on melting point. That's not something that you'll need to be using at this point. That's uh, just a mistake on, um, on my part. But you will need to read um, a little bit of uh, 
uh, of background material and take the online pre-lab quiz. So in this case, uh, the lab, as, as I said earlier, is focused solely on technique. So you want to make sure that you have two things um, uh, pretty, pretty well um, ironed out in the laboratory. You want to make sure that you have the sample name clearly indicated on your spectra. Um, that's very important. So as soon as you take your spectrum, as soon as you get the printout, write the sample name directly on that piece of paper. It's, it's very important that you keep up with that information. I also encourage you to make at least one, if not two, copies of your spectra. You can paste one copy in your notebook for, um, for accurate record keeping, and then you can keep the other two for your report. Um, if you make two copies, then you'll have um, uh, an extra copy just in case. There'll be three individual spectra, the original and the two copies. Um, I would keep the original for the report um, simply because it will be in color. Um, um, and uh, that might be helpful. Since this lab does focus, uh, since this lab focuses on technique, uh, you want to make sure that you watch the um, technique tutorial videos and pay very close attention to your lab instructor. Um, you may have an alternative schedule for this lab. That is, uh, you might not come in um, directly at the start of lab because we only have two instruments in the lab. Um, often, particularly with this type of acquisition we get a little bit of a bottleneck. So we might have the lab broken up into two segments. Um, one where half the lab shows up, half the, the um, individuals, half of these students show up and um, acquire spectra, and then the other half show up at a later time during the lab session. So um, be sure and check with your uh, lab instructor. Um, he or she should let you know prior to the day of lab. You want to make sure that you um, use the rubric as your title page and um, that you have signatures from both lab partners to receive full credit. This is very important. Otherwise, um, you do not see, receive full credit um, if, you're, if your signature is not on the lab report. That signature basically accounts for the fact that you, there's some equal distribution of work involved in, in creating the lab report. You also need to have a general um, experimental procedure, what you did, um, and it could be just as simple as um, prepared your sample, acquired the uh, spectrum, depending on what your um, instructor posts as uh, a general example for this method. Um, you should also have a reasonable results section. Um, this might have key um, infrared um, uh, frequency values and wave numbers corresponding to the um, uh, functional group um, that you've assigned. So you need to have your assignment written out in a table. So it's not as simple as just scribbling on a piece of paper and handing it in. You will need to um, go ahead and, and make a full analysis. And then, of course, um, append both copies of Lab Partners notebooks uh, to the uh, post lab. I want to thank um, Dr. Brandt um, and the other instructors, uh, Dr. Allison and Dr. Weatherman, uh, for their help in um, supplying the supplemental materials, um, Aldrich Chemical Company and Journal of Organic Chemistry for um, some information that was used in this video presentation. And thank you for your attention. The rest of this video is additional information regarding the interpretation of an infrared spectrum. Um, this could be um, potentially useful um, it could also be a repeat for um, those of you that have instructors that want to provide um, additional um, information for infrared analysis. Um, either way, I think it's a good thing, but uh, for those of you that have an, a different instructor, you may choose not to watch this particular segment if your instructor um, indicated um, that, that you would have a, an additional lecture for analysis and interpretation. The key thing um, for you guys moving forward is uh, the spectral database of organic compounds. So if you just Google SDBS, you should get um, the spectral database for organic compounds. You can type in a compound name, click search, and then you get the uh, relevant spectra for that particular compound. So it's uh, really important um, that you know how to use this. Um, the this is basically what you're doing there is matching spectra. Uh, because an infrared spectrum of a compound is sort of like the fingerprint for that compound, 
you can match them exactly and this information is transferable between um, spectrometers. So you should be able to take a spectrometer um, uh, or a spectrum that was taken in Japan, and many of these were, and, and a spectrum that was taken here at Bruce Holman and match them directly if you have uh, the same compound and the same purity. So it, it is a, a very useful um, resource uh, for that purpose. So you can match compounds. Now, all that does is basically allow you to determine um, matching compounds. This is, has nothing to do with analysis. This is just um, a, a basic um, um, interpretation. So this is, this is a, uh, an assignment of the correct compound to the actual spectra. This is not really analysis. Um, in terms of analysis, there are several features that you'll need to pay attention to. Um, one is the shape of the peak. So there are a couple of terms that we use to describe the shape of the peak. That's narrow and broad. So you may have a, a narrow band or a broad band um, in terms of the shape of the peak. And, and these are also transferable between spectrometers um, as long as your sample is in the same phase. That is uh, liquid, solid, etc. There are other terms um, that are used to describe the shape of a peak, and that is uh, singlet versus a doublet. So sometimes you'll see a, a peak has been split, um, and that's, a, that's another term that we can use. And then we have the intensity of the peak. So there's shape and intensity. And so intensity is either strong, medium, or weak bands. And we refer to them as bands, typically. And um, um, that's a sort of a relic, a tradition from uh, gas phase spectra. Um, peaks are also used as well, so those, those terms can be used interchangeably, band or peak, to describe the signature. Now, I'll show you an example. So this is a spectrum of benzophenone. Um, you'll notice that the y-axis is percent transmittance. That is the standard for organic um, uh, compounds. And the, um, I, I think I said y-axis is percent transmittance. The x-axis is wave numbers. Um, so it's an in inverse centimeters. That's the... Um, uh, the unit uh, of frequency that we use to describe um, where in the electromagnetic spectrum, in this case particularly the infrared uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum, the peaks reside. The Fourier transform um, comes about because the, react the, uh, the experiment is taken in real time. So you get a, a time domain dependence and then the transform then converts it to the frequency domain. Um, and so we get these nice resolved peaks um, that have their various intensity based on percent transmittance um, and then um, at, a very, at a specific frequency and wave numbers. And there's just some examples of uh, terms that you would apply to these different peaks. So the one on the far left there you see is a weak apparent doublet. And we call it apparent doublet because it appears as though it's a doublet. It might just be two peaks where the shoulders, are, um, the shoulders of the peaks are, are overlaid. Um, it's a weak peak because it doesn't have a very strong uh, um, um, signal in the infrared. You'll see the strong, sharp singlet um, there around 1,700 wave numbers. This is a, a very characteristic of a carbonyl. And so each one of these peaks correspond to a particular mode in, um, in the molecule. And so the molecule, when it's excited by infrared radiation, undergoes a series of transitions. And those transitions can be anything from a stretching, um, that is bond stretching between two atoms, or a bending mode, or a wobbling mode. So this can, the molecule basically does calisthenics, you know, molecular calisthenics exercises, right? And so it can roll around, it can walk from side to side, it can uh, stretch. And so all of these, these motions um, in the molecular vibrations are picked up in the infrared spectrum. And that's what we analyze. And each one of those are signature for a specific type of transition for a particular set of atoms. And we call the collection of atoms um, that are routinely observed in organic chemistry functional groups. Um, here's another example. This is benzoic acid. You'll notice now we have this broader peak. You see that's kind of hard to see. It looks like it's kind of split up into a bunch of smaller peaks, but in fact that's one larger peak um, that, that has other signatures overlaying on it. Um, there's our, our sharp, strong singlet there, right around 1,700 wave numbers. That's another carbonyl, uh, we call that a carbonyl stretch, because it's, it's a result of a stretching motion. Now, I'm going to go through and look at each of the different functional groups, that is, the, the groups that are 
uh, traditionally observed in organic chemistry um, and uh, look at some of those signatures. So the CH stretch uh, for an sp3 hybridized carbon, so this is, uh, we call those the alkyl groups, um, are observed right around 3,000 wave numbers. So you can see the CH stretch um, mode there. You can see also the bending modes are highlighted on this slide. Uh, I think the stretch is the one that we typically um, uh, want to analyze or interpret in an infrared spectrum. That allows us to uh, further make the justification for our assignment. And the assignment, again, is putting a name with a picture. That is, what is the name of this compound based on this infrared spectrum? That's the assignment. The analysis is more of a full investigation. You know, what does this peak relate to? What does it mean? That, that kind of thing. So that's what we're going through now. It's just the, uh, the analysis. Um, so the alkyl regions between about 2,500 and 3,000 wave numbers. And um, uh, the vinyl region or the alkenyl region um, is a little bit lower than that. So um, less than uh, 3,000 wave numbers. These are generally weak bands. Um, and these are only CH stretches. Okay, so that's all I'm talking about here. Around 3,000 are CH stretches. And then you have the alkynyl region. Um, which is the uh, CH uh, bond as a result of, uh, of an SP hybridized carbon. And so you'll see that's way on uh, further down, um, uh, greater than um, 3,000 wave numbers again, like the vinyl region. This might be closer to about 3,500. So this is around 3,300 typically. Um, there are other features that we can observe. So anytime you have a, a benzene ring, which is the um, uh, the, the structure shown there in green. Um, so benzene rings have some characteristic absorptions uh, around 3,000 because they have CH bonds. And then they also have what are called overtones. And those overtones um, are observed right around 1,500 in green on this slide. And then there are uh, some other signatures, uh, uh, bending modes around uh, 800 wave numbers. And so you can sort of see um, the bending mode at 800 in blue. Um, it's in, a, in, it's in the uh, uh, dotted orange color box on this slide. Um, those are actually pretty intense peaks, so um, they can be useful in interpretation. Alcohols um, are another functional group that um, occur. You'll observe uh, transitions around 3,000 wave numbers. These are a little bit higher. Um, so between 3,200 and 3,500 wave numbers. Um, and so you'll observe um, OH peaks become broadened as the, um, uh, as the degree of hydrogen bonding increases. And so that's basically what's happening. In dilute solutions, those become more narrow. And in the gas phase, they're extraordinarily narrow. Um, so here's a typical example. This is a cyclohexanol. This is one of your... Um, uh, products you'll be working with this quarter in organic chemistry. So you see there at A, the pink, it's a very broad, um, very intense peak. Amines uh, are not anything we're going to be working with this year in lab, this quarter in lab, um, but they do have relatively sharp peaks. Again, that's the uh, NH stretch. Um, the number of NH bonds corresponds to the number of NH peaks, so that's really um, a nice correlation. And probably the most useful group is the carbonyl group. Um, you'll see these signatures around, these are stretches, around 1,700 wave numbers. They're very strong, very narrow, very distinctive. Uh, so if you see their D, um, the uh, long peak, the sharp, uh, strong singlet there around 1,700, that's your carbonyl stretching peak. And so that's a, that's a very useful um, signature. And then... Um, not to be confused with a, a ketone or an aldehyde, the carboxylic acid also has a carbonyl, um, a CO stretch, right, even though the functional group is different. Um, so you also have the OH stretch. Um, you also have the C double bond O stretch as well. So anything that has that C double bond O should give you a signature around 1700. So it's very useful to observe. Um, you can uh, look at some other features. So the the position of that 1700 can move between 1650 and um, maybe even sometimes all the way up to 1800 wave numbers, uh, just uh, as a result of conjugation. It's basically 
um, a result of the um, various resonance forms of a um, molecule. Resonance is something we'll talk a lot about in lecture, so um, that, should, um, that should key in there for you. There are other functional groups that are very useful. Um, there's the triple bond region, um, which uh, can be uh, very kind of, kind of interesting for you to see. Um, and, and that's basically, uh, there's not much there in the triple bond region on an infrared spectrum. So if you see something between um, about 2100 and about 2300, probably some type of triple bond, might be some overtones, but um, these, are, uh, these are pretty um, unique signatures. Typically sharp, not very strong bands. Um, the fingerprint region is um, below 1500 wave numbers. This is typically not analyzed, um, so we typically don't interpret that region of the spectrum um, in terms of uh, trying to pick out every individual band and transition because it's very, very complex. Um, we call this the fingerprint region because um, it is not only complex to interpret, but does um, give you a particular signature for each individual molecule. There are a few things that we do look at. Um, aromatic modes, the CO stretch, the single bond stretch, and um, a few bending vibrations, and the classic walrus teeth of the uh, nitro compounds. So here's your nitro walrus teeth you see there at C. Um, two big old sharp singlets there around 1500. Um, if you see those, you know that you have a, a compound with a nitro group. And um, the other one is a CO stretch, right? So it's a, typically, again, a very sh uh, strong band um, right around 900 or so wave numbers. So these are uh, um, typically, uh, sorry, not 900, I'm sorry, 1100 wave numbers. So between 13 and 1100 wave numbers. Very useful um, in terms of interpretation. Okay, so that's about it. Those are the uh, primary functional groups that you'll need to uh, observe or recognize in an infrared spectrum. You don't have to do this on your own. There's not going to be any test about analysis. It's just a, a, a way for you to feel a little bit more comfortable behind the wheel of the infrared um, uh, spectrometer. So again, the key is uh, using STBS. You want to do some, um, uh, some comparison and make sure that you can make the correct assignment. Uh, but then any interpretation that you have past that is, is bonus. Um, the figures were taken from uh, Dr. Bruce's organic chemistry text and, um, um, and uh, also from SDBS. Thank you very much for your attention and have fun and be safe in lab.